What's good, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your number one source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. I am one of your hosts, Brittany Brombacher, alongside the beautiful, the salty, the sodium one, Christine Steimer. Oh, hello. Oh, hey, girl. I will raise your blood pressure if you are not careful. Ooh. I feel like that's an attractive thing to say, though, for some reason. Uh, Sure. Or maybe it's the stupid. I, I don't know. I I still stand by the fact that Andrea got me sick. I know she likes to claim I got it from some other place like an airplane or travels, but I just like to blame her. Travels isn't a place. Well, during my travels. Anyway, yes. I'm on a Sudafed. Sudafed high right now. So I'm on a Sudafed. I'm on a Sudafed. Suda, 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 Suda oh boy, yeah, Sudafed. Feed it in my tum tum. Wait, is that something <laughs> you literally just made up? Did you literally just make I that might up? also be having a moment. I don't know what's going on. Did you me. make yeah, that up? That was fucking yes. incredible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you missed a shit show before this. Timer and I are just in a rare form. We don't know what's going on. I think we're at our I breaking point. I think. Yes. <laughs> so This is going to be a good show. Oh, it's going to be a good show. Before we started shooting, we laughed uncontrollably about an audio wavelength. And uh, yes, that's uh, the... I'm slightly crying. Oh, man. So, so, yes, this is another Brit and Steimer show, the Steinbockers. We are back. We yes. are reunited. Segment one is all Steinbockers all the time. All but in segment two, we have a little dose of Miss Andrea Renee. She comes on in. I just spoiled that for you, I guess. But you know, I want you to know that it's not only just us. <laughs> it's not just us. No, she is still in Australia. Oi, gov. And she, Oi. we planned for her to be here for the entire episode. However, her internet situation is just kind of less than ideal. So the probability of us shooting a show with her internet staying stable the entire time was probably like 0.12%. So we're like, why risk it? We'll do a Steinbacher show, but we'll bring Andrea on so we can talk about The Division 2. Oh. Steinbacher? It's so Steinbacher and then like Andrea's kind of our mistress. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just brought her in for 30 minutes Yeah, we just brought her in for, like, a little fun, and then, you know, we're back to us. Sent her on her way in Australia to go Mm -hmm. do something with kangaroos, ride a kangaroo or something, I don't know. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is the What's Good Games podcast, and we are brought to you this week by Quip and Stitch Fix. But we're going to talk about that in a hot minute, because first of all, we just got notice that our What's Good Live PAX East panel has been accepted they want woo, woo. To, we're coming back for Thursday, March 28th at 6.30 p.m. in our Bobcat Theater. In our, did I say, oh, I said in our Bobcat Theater because I copied and pasted the email from the PAX staff. Steimer and right. I do not own the Bobcat Theater. We could, we could. if we, like, wanted to one day. I love this show so much. This is too much fun. So yes, What's Good Games Live, Thursday, March 28th, 630 at Bobcat Theater. We're also trying to get a meetup in the works. But you know us, we kind of like to wait until the last minute to get that shit done. Well, that and the Whiskey Priest closed down. So. I know, I'm so sad about that. That was my favorite. We are SOL. What are we going to do? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We'll just have to party party in the streets. Maybe not. That's not uh, a good go- idea. Nope. Oh, wait. I shouldn't sing anything that's copyrighted. I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. We can't sing copyrighted songs because we'll get docked for it. So, yes. Simer, this segment yes. of the West Good Games podcast is brought to you by Quip. So, starting a healthy routine and sticking to it are two very different things, Steimer. Inevitably, Don't I know it? Mm-hmm, inevitably, we all skimp on that full night of sleep, skip a workout or two, or brush our teeth with a tired old toothbrush. We're not perfect, but we can do better, and Quip is a better electric toothbrush that can help. Sensitive sonic vibrations help you achieve an effective clean that's gentle on your sensitive gums. People brush too hard, and some electric toothbrushes are too abrasive. I am a victim of harsh teeth brushing because my little gums are very sensitive from having braces for seven years, and... My dentist are always like, you have very thin gums. We might have to do a gum draft on you someday. So I am very well aware of 
this issue. Plus, it's got a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides and to help you clean your whole mouth evenly because up to 90% of us don't brush for a full two minutes or don't clean evenly. Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association. They're backed by over 25,000 dental professionals and they have thousands of verified five-star reviews. So, like I said, I love Quip because not only is it gentle on my little thin baby ass gums, but I like how it has the 30 <laughs> the 30 second timer because I've said this before, brushing my teeth, it's cool, but I feel like it can be productive while I'm doing it. So, maybe I'll be posting on social media or checking social media or on my email, and I tend to forget that I have more than one half of my mouth I have to brush because you know you're kind of like half ass in it. You're like, yeah, I'm brushing totally. my teeth and doing something, but when those little things go and it vibrates, it's like, oh, you're like, ah, signal, move. Signal. And Next I know you, part of mouth. yes, and you take your quip with you. Yeah, my little quip's in there, hanging out, being beautiful, being, beautiful. being nice, small, compact, yeah. and effective. I always say it at Andrea's like it. when we stay there. It's all fancy pants. Yes. I bring it with me everywhere now. The other other toothbrush bit the dust, so now it is my one and only. Another one bites the dust. Uh uh-uh. uh. So this is why we love Quip and why over 1 million happy, healthy mouths do too. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash what's good right now, you can get your first refill pack for free. That's your first, first, I can't talk. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash what's good. Do it. Take care of your teeth. What's good. It's in your mouth. Speaking of my mouth, I have a very dry mouth right now, so I'm going to take some water. You go ahead and you take yourself a sip of water. Should I go ahead and drop the first bit of news on us? Drop it like it's hot, baby girl. Oh, my God. Well, you know, it's fun that we are talking about dropping because Respawn (laughs) drops a new Battle Royale game, Apex Legends, for free on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. So this was a sort of holy shit moment Mm -hmm. this week. Um The leaks and rumors were true. This comes from GameSpot. Apex Legends, a new challenger in the Hunger Games that is the Battle Royale genre, is real and it's here. Respawn Entertainment Shooter is part of the developer's Titanfall universe. And despite just being announced, it's already available to download on PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4. I just said that. Um, Respawn teased the free-to-play game, which makes its money selling in-game cosmetic item in-game cosmetic items on social media over the weekend, following leaks that spilled some details onto the interwebs. The developer broadcasted a live stream to deliver the official announcement and to take a first look at the game. Apex Legends follows Battle Royale games like Fortnite and PUBG while making a few key changes to the formula. First off, it is a wholly team-based game with 20 teams of three players facing off on one large map. Like other games in the genre, you and your squad enter Apex Legends with no weapons or items and have to scavenge everything you need to be the last team standing. But the big difference between Apex Legends and other games is that it's uh, got inclusions like characters you choose from the beginning of the match. So it's more character driven. Each character has a different role in your squad and different special abilities, including ultimate abilities that charge up over time. A la Overwatch. It feels it's like Overwatch and Mm. PUBG had a baby. Uh, You're still finding all your guns, armor and items on the islands, but you have specific capabilities you can combine with your teammates that affect your strategy. There are eight characters also called legends in the game at launch and respawn will be adding more over time. Respawn has also uh, added some more innovations to the battle royale genre in its ping system. So with the dedicated button, you can ping locations, objects and other players, marking them on your teammates screens and drawing their attention to them. If you've ever played a MOBA, you know what a ping is. Uh, (laughs) Ping (laughs) a piece of loot and your character will call it out and mark it for someone else should they need it. While pinging enemies allows you to call out their location to your squad. Um, Since it's free to play, that means it includes obviously microtransactions. You can buy premium currency to purchase items and loot boxes called Apex Packs. And you'll also earn in-game currency and packs as you play. Uh, Six of the game's characters are yours when you fire up Apex Legends with two more purchasable with either in-game currency or premium currency. Another interesting note about these microtransactions that's not in this story, but I saw it, I believe, on Twitter uh, or maybe a different story I was reading. I do not remember. But the way that they outlined what was in their loot boxes was really transparent and actually pretty cool. Oh, did it so, get... Yeah, tell me. Yeah, it gave very specific breakdowns of what was guaranteed to be in that box. Like items of this rarity are like, yes, you will 100% get this. And then it broke down precisely what percentage chance you had to get the other types. Um, so 
Yeah, what did you think when this happened, Brittany? So I was on the Twitters over the weekend, and I saw a whole bunch of influencers starting to talk about this game. I can't remember if they actually named named it, but I remember hearing it's a respawn battle royale game. And so I don't know. Did you see any of this on Twitter? I honestly didn't until it was like announced, announced and being played. Yeah. yeah. So this was Sunday, and it caused a little bit of a hubbub because my understanding is that respawn had traditional media and then influencers at this event that obviously was under um, embargo NDA until supposedly until Monday. And Mm -hmm. it, when these, when the influencers started leaking this information, I think a lot of the media was like, yo, this is weird. Like, why is this happening? But then some people think that it's also, it was planned to kind of get the hype going and the hype buzzing. And there are some issues with whether or not they needed, the influencers needed to have hashtag ad in their tweets. And it was kind of like people were getting pissed off. So I was very well aware of this game's existence just because of all the hubbub on Twitter. So with that said, um, I mean, cool. I I was going to play that this weekend or Monday when it released, but I was like, you know, Battle Royale games just aren't my jam. But uh, I guess the, the overall response I've seen from people in the industry is that, hey, you know, it plays great. It looks great. And people are having fun with it. So that's good. Good job. Respond. Yeah, totally. I, I like that they didn't just create a, another Battle Royale game. I mean, it is obviously a Battle Royale game, but... I like that they made it their own with both the, the you know the three team squads and then not three team the three person squads uh, and then you know pitting a bunch of people against each other. I prefer that to being solo. I never ever want to be alone in this type of a game. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't leave me. And then another thing that I think is interesting that they did that they don't mention in this article, but again I was reading about this game because I'm very curious and I want to give it a shot, but I need to find people to play with me. Mm. Uh, that surprises is me. that there's well I'd mostly just want to try it because yeah. it is so different I don't think this will be a game that I play a lot of because like you don't typically enjoy pvp because I'm not great at it and I don't it's not a thing that's going to unwind me for the day right no <laughs> by any means um but they actually have the ability to respawn you in yes. this game which is really interesting so um if Brittany and I were playing a match and maybe Jason's our third. Why not? And poor Brittany dies. I bleed out. She bleeds out in the beginning. I have number one. There's the ability if if someone shoots you and they're maybe far away, I have a choice. I can get to you and like no one else is shooting me, and I can revive you. Then there's a short window then where I can just I think probably hit a button and yeah. similar to other video games get you back up. However, if you're like dead, dead, like you're in the middle of a firefight, you've run out where to a place you should not be. I can't get you. I can't save you, baby girl. I can still, like, wait around for everyone else to clear out if I am perhaps hidden. Mm. Come back to the bloodbath. Pick up your banner, I believe it's called. So it's a it's a tag. So after I bleed out or I'm executed, you have 90 seconds <laughs> to get to me and grab my tag. And get the tag. Okay, yeah. there we go. So yeah, so there's a, there's a, there's a window there, too. Um, and then in order to, if I have your tag, I have to go find a respawn beacon. Beacon. And put myself at risk to like get you back in the game, but I think that I think that even having that risk or reward is really interesting. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, it, it can you imagine? I mean, obviously this happens in other battle royale games, like but getting knocked out immediately and one of your teammates is still playing, you're just sort of trapped. Yeah, watching the, them, the, watching them this <laughs> whole time. No, I think that's a super. I thought that was also interesting too, and it's it's cool that they're innovating this uh, genre now, because yeah, like you said you get the tag and then you have to get to a beacon and not die there. Mm -hmm. And then you have to interact with this beacon for a few seconds, which, you know, every second in a battle Royale game, like is a death sentence. And then this big ship apparently flies overhead and then everyone can see the ship. And then that's where the, your character comes from, but they arrive like naked and afraid. They ain't got nothing on them. They have no gear or anything. Right. So it comes to that point. Do you guys just try to get out of there or do you try to give me gear? So I have a fighting chance. Yeah. It's an interesting innovation. I think it's it's good. Run for the Hills. And I like that they, um, they it's, you're not just playing generic bro. I do like that. They are making characters that have, um, somewhat of both an aesthetic feel and then a play style feel Mm -hmm. i think it's a cool choice um and i'm i am interested to play this only because it is 
much different than what everything else sounds like. I also think, uh, now I don't know too much about it, but you mentioned, you know, the whole influencers mm-hmm. and uh, the hashtag ad thing. So this does seem to have a very big paid push behind it. Uh, if it's not, then I don't know why the fuck they're putting hashtag ad in there because that seems weird. Right. But uh, I would say that it, even if that's the case, this has to be one of the more successful launches I've seen in quite some time. Exactly. So it's interesting because how often do you see that a game just drops like this? You don't really see that. So lead producer Drew McCoy had a really interesting quote about this. Um, he said our desire and this was all to Eurogamer. He said our desire to be completely open and transparent with our player base and a part of that expands to how we talk about problems and we understand this game is going to have a skeptical audience. There are some people who think that there are too many battle royale games or it's a fad. The world thinks we're making Titanfall 3 and we're not. We'll talk about that in a second. This is what we're making to try and convince a skeptical audience for months with trailers and hands on articles. We're just like, let's let the game speak for itself. It's the most powerful antidote to potential problems. And he's totally right. You know, could you imagine if a few months ago or, you know, today they're like, hey, you know, response first game after being acquired under EA is a free to play battle royale game with loot crates and microtransactions. Like, oh, yeah, it would have been a fucking shit show. How would that have gone down, right? It, it would not have right. gone down well. So I think this is brilliant, and this is one of the few instances where I think just stealth dropping something like this just worked incredibly well, and it's like, Dude, yeah. I think whoever made that choice, it was absolutely the correct call. I actually think, I, honestly, even though I know a lot of people are put off by paid media influencer, not media, paid influencer campaigns, mm-hmm. I think they also worked really well in their favor. Oh, yeah. And even though there probably will be a drop-off, like once that stops, mm-hmm. um, I think it definitely put their name out there in such a way like everyone is talking about it. And if the game has legs now to stand on its own and be, you know, be its own, be its own thing, you will see very quickly here. Yeah. Um, but God, I mean, they certainly have kicked off with a bang. I think have you. What was the latest player number? It was in the millions. They definitely crossed a million yeah, players. Vince Sampella tweeted out that they. I don't have it here, but I think, yeah, a million. And then there was some other concurrent number that was out there that I don't have yeah. on top of my head. But no, it's really exciting. Um, Some other tidbits about this game. They, from, again, Drew McCoy, lead producer of Apex Legends, is all from uh, Eurogamer. Regarding Switch and mobile, they'd love to bring it to mobile and Switch, but there's nothing they can currently talk about. Regarding cross-play and cross-progression, there are, quote, plans to allow players to play with their friends on other platforms, but cross-progression and cross-purchases will never be possible due to the way systems were set up early on. And this, this, okay, and they're, oh yeah. And the other thing that people are wondering, like, why aren't there Titans? Why isn't there wall running, double jumping, and all that kind of thing? And what they alluded to was when, you, when you're in a big Titan, right? You have like this power fantasy, and I think that was the exact word they used, where you're this big bad robot that you can just squish all those stupid humans and step on them and blah, blah, blah. That obviously doesn't work very well in a Battle Royale game. And to make that balance they'd have to make a titan that's not super powerful but then that kind of takes away again the power fantasy of having titans so while this game does take place in the titanfall universe there are not titans in this game and the wall running and double jumping it just didn't make sense either so they they dinked around with all of that but just none of it made into the final game and they and to be fair they could still be like maybe it could work on some other way in the future like air droppings i don't know whatever they could figure out a way to make it work right. uh, possibly but it makes sense why they wouldn't launch with that because it would just feel busted um another interesting thing i'm just i just started scrolling through the twitter now because mm-hmm. i was trying to find the number it was a million unique players also is what the uh. but i feel like there was a different number of downloads that might have been two million but i also could be making that up you could be um, who knows what i find interesting here is that they're already doing a twitch rivals Oh. February 12th. And so for those who don't know, Twitch Rivals is a it's a Twitch instituted like tournament where you have to stream and you have to stream on Twitch, you have to stream this game. But these things take a while to set up. They take like at least a month or two oh, wow. to get set up. So that's interesting that they're doing one already. So basically whoever kicked off this campaign, hats off to you. Well done. You've impressed Queen Steimer. so on this note never ye fear for another titanfall game will still launch this year 
but sadly it is not Titanfall 3. So this comes from Eurogamer. So the news was initially teased by Respawn CEO Vince Zampella, who last night, which was February 5th, dropped the T, Titanfall word, on Twitter to promise more Titanfall content this year. It's worth noting his phrasing here, which hints that that hints this will be another experiment in the Titanfall universe. So here's the quote. Tons of things planned for at play Apex in the future. We are also committed to listening to player feedback. We are also working on more Titanfall for later in the year. Yes, I said the T word. We love being able to experiment in this crazy universe. Thankfully, a little more light was shed on the situation by EA head Andrew Wilson in a quarterly earnings call. Quote, the Respawn team has a strong plan for Apex Legends that will engage fans for a long time to come. As the live service evolves, Respawn also plans to launch a premium game this year that is a new twist on the Titanfall universe. More to come on that in the months ahead. I can't wait to play my pretty pony, Titanfall. <laughs> <laughs> like, where it's just you dressing up these titans and, like, oh making my them God. look real nice. And put them in pageants and shit. Yeah. Yeah, so... It and also worth clarifying that this Titanfall game is not their AAA VR experience. Vince Sampella confirmed that on Twitter. So we know Respawn's working on this AAA VR shooter that will not be this premium Titanfall experience. So interesting. It's sad that this isn't Titanfall 3. Uh, I, is it? I feel like Titanfall 2 kind of came out with a whimper. Well, yeah, that was because of its shitty launch window. It, it's just like... So I'm sad because... I mean, no, granted, I'm I'm not going to talk act like I'm the Titanfall guru, big fan, because I'm not. But from the people I've talked to, Titanfall 2 showed a lot of promise, specifically, you know, in the campaign, right? People, this is so fun. This is so good. Let's get another Titanfall. And it sounds like Titanfall 3 was work, being worked on. And then it was like that kind of morphed into Apex Legends, because at that time, they were, Respawn was seeing how well PUBG was performing, and they'd just been acquired by EA. And they're like, hey, let's do this. Um, yeah. So I guess it's sad for the Titanfall fans. I'm I guess I'm specifically not sad about it because I Okay, fair enough. It. Yeah, when you yeah. were like, that's sad. I'm like, is that sad for you? Because I feel like not you for don't me. Care. I have empathy, <laughs> Cyber. I have empathy. But yeah, we'll, we'll okay, see. Okay, that's fair. I, I'm curious to see what this game is going to be, though. Is it really going to be a, a Titan <laughs> Titan pageant on mobile? Here's the thing. Um, it doesn't say it's another game. Oh, let's see. You're right. It says it says we are working on more Titanfall for later in the year. We love being able to experiment in this crazy universe. Oh, it says wait. But Respawn also plans to launch a premium game this year. That is a new twist on the Titanfall universe. That's yeah, but that's not part of what he said. No. Okay. Wait, yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's the, what Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. Sorry. Good old boy Wilson. Good old boy with Wilson. Beautiful face. Dropping some knowledge about the Titanfall. Well, anyway, interesting. We'll see how this game does. I feel like if there's a um I still think it's pretty pony, pretty pony Titanfall. Pretty pony Titanfall. <laughs> put your put your pretty pony Titans in a pageant. <sighs> yes. All right, speaking of EA, some kind of bummer news. EA literally bummer is in this title. This comes from Ars Technica. EA turns in bummer fiscal reports, quote, we're disappointed in our underperformance. And I somehow copy and pasted that title in there twice and I almost read it twice. Because it's it's a double bummer. Double <laughs> <That's> bummer. <why. laughs> All right. So EA's latest quarterly fiscal report included a stark admission. Battlefield 5 sales fell way below expectations. This, combined with a severe drop in mobile gaming revenue, led EA's executives to admit that they were, quote, disappointed in our underperformance in fiscal Q3 2019. Battlefield 5's sales to date, according to EA COO and CFO Blake Jorgensen, have reached 7.3 million copies across all platforms worldwide, which the company says is 1 million less than it had indicated in previous Q3 2019 guidance. Jorgensen didn't mince words. He blamed the drop in the series' uptake on the developer's focus on a single-player campaign as opposed to having a promised Battle Royale mode ready for fans in time for the game's launch. EA CEO Andrew Wilson took the opportunity to confirm Battlefield 5's Battle Royale mode, currently dubbed Firestorm, will launch in March of this year. The executives repeatedly blamed, quote, intense competition in that quarter for general underperformance, which Wilson clarified later as Fortnite, Call of Duty, and Red Dead Redemption 2. Wilson added that Battlefield 5's release delay into November 2018 resulted in a better game, but he cited the combination of a poor start in our marketing campaign with a longer development cycle that puts us in a more competitive window. 
When asked about EA's sales expectations for Anthem in the wake of a wonky public demo, Jorgen, their words, not ours, Jorgensen said it was pretty wonky. <laughs> Jorgensen said that EA still expects its first quarter sales to reach roughly 5 to 6 million units. We're comfortable with that based on what we're seeing in the outcome of both demos. A lot of excitement, a lot of interest. EA also confirmed that EA, it almost sounded, sounded like I said he, but I did not. I thought you said EA. EA. <laughs> yeah, I can confirm that a, that a range of console specific games is expected to launch in by year's end, including a new Plants for Zombies shooter, a new game in the Need for Speed series, and the respawn developed Star Wars game Jedi Fallen Order. Slammer, hot take. That game by the end of this year? All they all Vince did last year was literally like smutter it in this in the audience. Yeah. And now and they didn't he wasn't even didn't seem quite sure of what the fucking title was so i'm a little bit confused as to how that game's coming out this year but okay also <laughs> also with titanfall you're you're telling me respawns coming out with three games this year yeah how many people work at that studio so if this you know is... how many people work on call of duty there's like six studios it's insane i so, think I, EA sorry. has no, no no you're not wrong i think they not yet i think respawn has two different sections of their studio I think I read that. I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're definitely split teams. But, but you're right. Like, that's that's a... So, a Plants for Zombies shooter, Need for Speed, Jedi Fallen Order, Um, this... I don't believe him. Titanfall I don't premium believe experience. Jedi is coming out here. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. I mean, obviously, these kind of conversations to have is, like, not good. You know, that we were disappointed we didn't do that well. Maybe I don't know how this works. I'm not going to pretend like I'm a big wig. Big wig, I'm a child. But when, <laughs> I wonder if they're just saying, hey, we have all these things coming out to keep the spirits high. Of totally. Those yeah, invested. I mean, for, for any investment calls, yes, you want to, obviously. <laughs> I don't know where the line is with those calls, right. like, where it's just straight up lying. You know, like, I hope I, <laughs> I assume that they are not allowed to do that. Um, but and so it's I mean, it's totally possible that Respawn is tracking to hit that. I just find it to be slightly insane, if true. Uh, mm -hmm. only because they will be like the most the best managed studio I've ever seen in my life to be able to deliver on those things. Oh boy, you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? If this happens, okay, so, so okay, specifically, what needs to happen for you to consider this one of the best run studios you've seen in your life? If they launch all three of these games and they are all successful, and by successful, I will give them it. I mean, critically, not necessarily financially. Okay, so Jedi: The Fallen Order, Titanfall Premium Experience, and then what's the the third one? I mean, Apex just needs to sustain. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. <laughs> this Because, like, that's that's madness. It's madness to, to launch Sparta. three things. I know. It's crazy. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's what you got to do. I'm curious to see how Battlefield's Firestorm does. Yeah, and that's interesting, too. It's crazy that 7.3 million copies, I mean, granted, they were projecting like 8.3, apparently, if you take this literally, how that's just not good enough sometimes anymore. And I mean, I mean that's a lot of money you're leaving on the table when you project that much. That's true. That is very true. That's like, that's like a, that's a big fucking miss. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. You're right. You know, you're totally right. I think it's just more of like, I see 7.3 million and I, a consumer. Sure, and you're like, I'm oh, a, my God, that's amazing. I'm impressed. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, as like a random person would be, but when you are yeah. the CEO of a company and your analysts told you you would definitely hit this number and you missed it by a million, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. not as great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very true. And it's also interesting how Jorgensen says he blamed the drop in the series uptake on the developer's focus on a single player campaign as opposed to having a promised battle royale mode ready for fans in time for launch. Well, I think that's interesting because... Um, I think it would, it's interesting to pit it against Call of Duty, for instance, which mm. opted to just not do a single-player campaign. So Battlefield Five released November 20th, 2018. I'm checking Call of Duty's release date. Call of Duty. And then Call of Duty released October 12th, 2018. So yeah, about a month apart-ish. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. Never that far. Um, actually, I wonder. Now I'm like, what were Call of Duty sales numbers? Because I actually... <laughs> I think they're pretty I never paid high. attention. Huh? I, know, I know. Here's the thing. Numbers sometimes like they can be fun to look at, but sometimes you know they all be they all blend, bleed into one big number in your head. They really do. Mhm. Mm 
Um, where are some fucking things? Sales records. We're looking what? this up to the big Google machine. I know, because I'm mostly like how, I want to know how much better it did than Battlefield. That's what I want to know. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, while That's Activision hasn't shared actual sales numbers of Call of Duty games, uh, da, 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 da. it sold more digital. Oh, they- yeah, it sounds like we're not getting any specific numbers off the bat. They're just anyway. saying best selling blah de blah, which is garbage. Yeah. And they've given sales like figures in terms of fi- $500 million, for instance, million, yeah. in the first three days, but that's not telling me also, how many copies are sold. My dog needs to stop opening my door because what – Reb, you're a creeper. <laughs> no, so for those of you who don't know, you probably don't know because most of you except for Simon have never been to my house before. So I have these two computer monitors, and they block the, the – bottom half of my doorway and I'm in clear sight of my doorway so randomly my door will just open and then I'm like okay there's no human coming through sometimes I think maybe it's Jason coming in to like give me whiskey because he's the best I don't know but no it just fucking opens and then I can't see my dog come in and then I think my house is haunted and it's a sad day it's definitely haunted that's the only explanation that makes any sense okay let's if we're going off this is very bad math so please don't kill me if you divide 500 million by sixty dollars. Oh no, Simer! <laughs> it's eight point three million, I think. You do it too. You do the math too to make sure that I, I'm not going to tell you what math I did. You just do this math how you think you would do it. Uh, Four <laughs> five hundred million. What did you say? Five hundred million oh divided God. by sixty. <laughs> this is goddamn ridiculous. Eight point three million. Yes. Okay. So theoretically, Call of Duty sold 8.3 million in the first three days. Theoretically. Now, oh, wait, 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 this wait, is wait. my really bad napkin math. So 500 million uh, in sales worldwide. Now, does that include any? Was there day one DLC? See, I don't know. Any day one shit that people could have paid for that maybe made those numbers nice and fat? yeah, it could have. Yeah, because again, they only they only did revenue. They didn't say. Uh-huh copies so like i don't know what exactly is in that number. either way so, we know that the lack of a campaign does not negatively affect a call of did Duty. not hurt it that was kind of my point is i would love to see the the side by sides not necess- not how much money was made but i'd love to see copies sold through mm-hmm. um to yeah. do it to see whether or not it's if battlefield really is like yeah we focus on a campaign and like no one fucking cared because that's not why people are playing shooters they're playing shooters because for the most part they want either a a sort of co-op experience like zombies or they want a pvp experience or they want a battle royale pvp experience which is a different type of pvp Mm -hmm. like those are the types of things that this audience may be looking for absolutely and you know. Then you have your one offs like me who's like, Hey, I just want to play the story on baby ass baby mode and then that's right. Like, like but you don't make them enough money, Brittany. I know, sad day. But that's a really interesting <laughs> thought because I remember when we were talking about this, it was like, Okay, is this actually going to inflate battlefield sales because those people who aren't getting their campaign in Call of Duty, maybe they'll go to Battlefield. Well, who knows? Well rip. Well rip. Rip campaigns for Call of Duty and Battlefield. I imagine the next Battlefield will not have a big single player focus, given what he just said here. I love my single player. And if it does, that would be really weird. Yeah, I love my single player campaigns, though, and shooters. Because I'm not good enough to play with the Rockets. I never finished them. The the last one that I finished all the way through was uh, Modern Warfare, the Mm. first one. Mm. Wow, wow. Yeah. Damn girl. Because the other ones I've played a few hours of, and then I get bored and I don't finish. Yeah. Well, there you go. Don't make him first yeah. timer. She won't play him. Nope. Don't do it. Mm-hmm. But you know what you can do? What? Give me some sweet, sweet Xbox news. Oh, girl. I love you. Look at these little segues. So, yes, Xbox oh, yeah. One had a live stream, the Xbox Insider live stream on Tuesday. And so we have a write-up from GameSpot, and they go over some of the – big fat juicy details that happened during that wonderfully produced show where we got to see lots of awesome people on there that we know and are friends with anyway so the number one i know right we actually have friends it's crazy oh my god so the number one takeaway was the not the number one necessarily in rank of importance but just the first takeaway here halo outpost discovery so uh here we go we're still not sure what's okay. So this is not the best write up to segue. So I will kind of talk about this. So obviously we don't know when Halo Infinite is coming. So they so now what Microsoft is doing is having these Halo Outpost discoveries that are coming to I think it's 
five different cities starting this summer, and they're going to yes. have a bunch of interactive activities you can do related to the Halo universe. So here it says... Uh, 343 and Microsoft will be hosting a traveling event with in-universe activities, panels, and more. It will visit five cities this year, open for one weekend in each. You can explore a Halo ring, visit a Warthog, play VR simulations and laser tag, attend panels with creators, and get cosplay tips. Plus, of course, you can just play yourself some Halo. So it's coming to Orlando, Philadelphia, Chicago, Houston, and Anaheim. No Seattle. <laughs> Hello. You're kind of yeah, like... Yeah, that's kind of weird. <laughs> What the heck, man? You're kind of based like, here. You're based here, and we're not. We don't care about I you. Know. In fact, like, yeah, the only uh, West Coast is Anaheim. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not salty about it at all. I mean, I really shouldn't be. They've had a lot of awesome uh, events in Washington. But it seems like they could have done six, right? Like, and done what? So Orlando is clearly like Southern Eastern. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia is Northern Eastern. Chicago, Upper Middle. Houston, Lower Middle. Anaheim, <laughs> Lower West, Seattle. Come on. I, I bet Upper West. I bet when this Halo Infinite kind of gets closer to release, they'll probably just have a big old thing that a, they usually... A launch event in Seattle. Yeah, they, they like, typically... Here's your event. Yeah, they typically do that with Halo launches, so that's okay. But no, this is really cool. I've done something similar like this before, the Warthog thing, and there, it's just really fun to get together with you know members of the Halo community, especially if you're a diehard fan, and just it feels good because it's been a while since we've gotten us some Halo, and this is I think a good another way. game I've never finished a campaign. No, that's not true. I did finish one campaign because I co-opted it with Greg. What? Oh my God, the Halo. I do not finish shooter campaigns. I just don't. I I understand. I will say the Halo series is one of my favorite series. I played each game probably three times each. They're so much fun and they're so different from your typical like you know, Call of Duty or Battlefield because they're not as I don't know what the word is. They have a certain charm to them that is just enjoyable and kind of lighthearted, even though some deep dark shit goes down. And I just love the physics in that game. It's so much fun. So anyway, while we're waiting for Halo Infinite, this is, I'm sure, a nice way to kind of keep the buzz afloat because otherwise this just seems kind of random, right? Like, why would you be having these events? Yeah, I mean, you want to keep Halo fans excited, right. I would assume. And so this is one of the ways to do it That's if you don't way. have anything else for them. Oh, Halo Infinite so bad. Oh. All right, next we have some Game Pass news for February. So the smallest month is bringing some big games to Xbox One Game Pass, the all-you-can-eat subscription service. The February no, lineup. I, want food. I know me too. The February lineup includes Shadow of the Tomb Raider, The Walking Dead Season One, and Batman: Return to Arkham, to name a few. The real headliner is Crackdown Three, which is finally Fuck yeah, it is. Oh, girl, which is finally really coming out after years of delays. As a Microsoft first-party game, it's included as part of Game Pass. So if you're a subscriber, you already you already as good as own it, girl. Girl. So I think this is awesome. Obviously, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a pretty recent game. Very cool that it's yep. coming to Game Pass. I think it's definitely worth playing. I, I enjoyed it, even though I never, sadly, got to finish it because too much shit came oh, out. I did finish that. It was good. Yeah. And Crackdown 3. So, Simer, let's talk about that real mm -hmm. quick. How, can you believe mm -hmm. that's coming out in just a few weeks? Dude, I'm so excited. And, like, I know people think that I'm probably stupid for being excited about it. But I have... I don't have overblown expectations for it i expect it to be cracked out like i expect it to be a, a better looking version of the first game and i'm fucking okay with that i don't care all i want is more of it because it's been years and i just want to run around i want something mindless to do at the end of the day and that's that's kinda, what i want that's something like mindless game. stupid fun that just feels good feels that's what good. i want yeah. yeah, yeah, baby girl. So speaking of that, this weekend, here's a little write-up. Microsoft is kicking off a multiplayer technical test starting tomorrow, which I think is going to be February 7th, but there has been no announcement as to how long this is going to last. So maybe you could mm. get in on it after this podcast releases. Here's That's what the thing. she said. I I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait. Yeah, you're going to wait? I always, I don't really particularly enjoy demos. I don't enjoy betas. I don't enjoy well, things that tease you i just want the thing you just want you don't want no foreplay is what you're saying i know foreplay for me please just give me the i would just like the thing that i want 
Just give me the thing that I want. There you go. So Microsoft says this is actually is not a beta. In other words, nothing significant about Crackdown 3 is going to change between now and release. Microsoft is just looking to collect data and perhaps hunt down a few extra bugs. So this technical test is available exclusively to members of the Xbox Insider program. Although becoming a member isn't difficult, just download the Xbox Insider Hub, sign up, and then download the Wrecking Zone technical test from the Insider content section. So this goes live February 7th at 9 a.m. and it begins at 12 p.m. on February 7th. There's no end time. So maybe by the time this podcast releases and you're not like Steimer, you'll be like, hey, I want to get in on that technical test. And then you're going to find out it's over. And for that, we apologize. It's over. But if it's not over, <laughs> you're welcome. We do what we can around here at What's Good Games. Yes, we do indeed. We also have some new Xbox One bundles. Both Anthem and The Division 2 are getting paired with Xbox Ones. The Anthem bundle includes the game's Legion of Dawn edition with bonuses and Xbox One S, one terabyte, and one month trial of EA Access, Game Pass, and Xbox Live Gold. That'll run you $300. And then there's a five, yeah, $300. No, 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 no. is that and right? Then the, then the, yes, and then The Division 2. Oh, that's right. Getting, that's, yeah, I got ahead of myself. Stuff as well. Yep. You did. So The Division 2 is getting two separate sets of bundles, one with a black Xbox One X for $500 and one with a white Xbox One S for $300. So that's why I was like, uh, no. Yeah, I saw you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, no, you're good. Keep Just keep reading, baby keep girl. Keep reading you're good. my words. <laughs> keep reading the words. So I guess if you're looking for an Xbox, there you go. Maybe yeah. now, now's the time yeah. to get in. There, you, That's what she said. Mayhaps, mayhaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then some Sea of Thieves news. So owners of Sea of Thieves or Game Pass subscribers can gift a copy of the game to up to three people, which will let them play for free until February 13th. After that, they can purchase it for 35% discount. Keep in mind that they'll need to a gold membership to play the online game. That was, yeah. That was not my fault. That, that was not your fault. See, that was a poorly written sentence I that just, you just read verbatim. I just read the thing like Simon told me to do, and then this is what happens. It's like, I love Lamp. I love Lamp. <laughs> also, on March 20th, Joe from Rare, who's wonderful, um, said that they have a big anniversary announcement that they're going to talk about a whole Aww. bunch of new content on March 20th. The content won't be necessarily ready on March 20th, but it's going to be That's when they're going to talk about it? Simon, That's good. Do you think we'll ever yeah. get PVE? I don't know. I don't know either. I... I really enjoyed the water in that game. That sounds oh my weird. God, but it, I mean, it's an ocean, so maybe it doesn't sound weird. But <laughs> it was just so relaxing. Yeah. I just want to, I want to know for sure that I can be relaxed in that game. I think that's what To it a is certain for me. degree. Yeah. Obviously, there's some crazy shit PVE wise, even that goes down with like the megalodons and whatever. Yes. But, um, you know, I just want to know that like, no, no one's going to off me and steal my shit. Yeah. That's all I want. Yeah. That's all I want in life. If I'm going to be looted, I want to be looted by AI, not a real person. There's something about sure. knowing that someone's being a jerk that just, you know, makes me sad. But it's fine. That's PvP. Yeah. I get it. Um, I mean, yeah, kudos to Rare. There's so much content I feel like in Sea of Thieves now. I remember it was just a year ago we were talking about, um, it was at GDC with Ka on the show. We were talking about Sea of Thieves and how we wish there was more content and blah, blah, blah. And now, you know, almost a year later, it sounds like there's a buttload of content and I want to hop yeah. back in. I just don't want to be killed because I'm a little baby. I understand. I'm also a little baby. A little baby. You read this, you read this bullet. I'm going to read the last one. Okay. We'll do that. There's a new red controller, ladies and gentlemen. Microsoft debuted the new Sport Red Edition, Sport Red Special Edition, which aside from the nifty paint job, features rubber grips along the back. Because sports, it will cost $70 and releases on March 5th. Now, I will say, this is a very sexy controller. It's very red. If you are a fan of the color red, and it's a deep, dark, bright red, I think it's good. I think it's interesting the um, that I am able, and you are able, and that gamers in general are able to be somewhat sexually attracted to things like <laughs> controllers. Because... <laughs> I do, I'm like, yes, that like there are, uh oh, I made Brittany you cough. You made me cough. I'm dying. It's fine. <laughs> Cause like there are definitely controllers where I'm like, oh my God, it's so sexy. Like that looks so good. Holy mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. That fucking design is so clean. Looks so good. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just, I don't know the way you said that. I was like, it's really weird that that's even a thing. Yeah. But I, I wonder know. if it's because we're being, because I don't think we We're literally to shiny objects. We don't literally mean it's sexy. We're not like right. We really don't want. We don't literally want to. We're fuck not sexually it, attracted to it. I mean, right. Some people. Okay, this could get go Some down. People to, maybe do, but right. Yeah. Not us. No, I'm trying to stop myself. We just appreciate the beauty. Yeah. In a slightly inappropriate way. Perfectly well said, Simon. <laughs> 
Okay, take your bullet. All right, I'm taking this one because I'll tell you after. Okay. Um, so Microsoft Game Studios becomes Xbox Game Studios. And a bit of branding news that you may notice when you first start up a first-party game in the future, Microsoft Game Studios is no more. It's been renamed Xbox Game Studios, which corporate VP Matt Booty, which is the best name of all time, says as a reflection of how the Xbox brand itself has expanded. This comes just after a series of acquisitions, so the newly rebranded Xbox Game Studios is now composed of 13 teams. Booty said the teams are working on... I'm sorry, Booty. <laughs> working <laughs> on incredible exclusives, original IP, and all new chapters from your favorite franchise. So you wanted franchises. to read this because of Booty. No. I wanted to read this because once upon a time when I was a little baby just getting into the gaming industry, okay. my very first job was doing public relations for Microsoft Game Studios. Oh. So I felt like I had to read the fact that Microsoft Game Studios is no more because Ooh. I used to work for them. That's amazing. And it's how kind of weird. It's sort of weird for me. I bet. So how long ago was that? <sighs> Wow, <laughs> trying to get me to date myself. Yeah. I see. Girl, you're okay, not. You're not a date. Everybody over knows 25. how old I am. It's fine. Um, that was. I was. Let's see. I just graduated college, so I was. How old are you when you graduate college? Are you 21, 22? 22. Uh, so then, because I immediately went from college to Edelman uh, Agency, which did Microsoft Games. I think I often yeah. forget that you hopped into the video game industry right after college. Like you didn't fuck yes. around. You're like this. No, is what I'm it doing. was legitimately step. It was step one. That was the first thing I ever did. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, that was over ten years ago. Yeah. Um, I want to say the booties are wonderful people. I have met Matt and hung out with his wife a few times. Great, nice people, and I love their last name. It's just brilliant. It's just what it it's just so makes fun. me giggle. And it's like, yeah, I like it a lot. It's a, booties are good. Um, this, I mean, this makes sense to change it from Microsoft Game Studios to Xbox Game Studios. I guess, I mean, is this going to have a huge impact on their productivity or their sales numbers or whatnot going forward? No, but I think they are gearing up for an amazing next gen. And I think this is just one of those things that's just going to make more sense and be like an additional buff on whatever they have coming up. Yeah, this just helps separate and establish xbox as a continued brand that microsoft is investing in mm -hmm. that's all yeah that's a good thing makes sense yeah makes sense all right we have more microsoft speaking of <laughs> more batshit crazy microsoft <laughs> oh news. my gosh i know it's all about ea and microsoft this week microsoft also if you need help reading because i know you're like struggling on i'm the starting to get wagon. to that point where i kind of sound like i'm pre like i'm going through puberty and my voice is crackling I think I can probably get through this one, and then you might have to take okay. it. <laughs> Microsoft, Microsoft plans Xbox Live for Nintendo Switch and mobile. What? What? what, what? So this comes from Eurogamer, and this broke, gosh, earlier this week. So Microsoft is readying a new level of Xbox Live support for Nintendo Switch, iOS, and Android devices. The Windows Maker teased the reveal due next month at GDC 2019 via the industry event's own conference schedule. The move will see Microsoft integrate Xbox Live achievements, friends, clubs, and game history into non-Xbox and Windows PC platforms for the first time. Quote, Xbox Live is about to get much bigger, Microsoft description reads. Xbox Live is expanding from 400 million gaming devices and a reach to over 68 million active players to over 2 billion devices with the release of new cross-platform XDX. Did you just do the, the Dr. Evil thing? Too? Yes, I did. 2 billion. billion. Oh my god, I love you so much. <laughs> Get a first look at the SDK to enable game developers to connect players between iOS, Android, and Switch in addition to Xbox and any game in the Microsoft Store on Windows PC. You, so, that's the end of the quote. You can already sign into your Xbox Live profile on Nintendo Switch and mobile platforms within certain Microsoft games, like the cross-platform Minecraft being the most obvious example. The deeper integration goes way beyond that, though, to tie non-Microsoft games on non-Microsoft platforms into Xbox Live as well. So, for example, if you're playing Warframe on Nintendo Switch, you could earn Xbox achievements. Or if you're playing Fortnite on mobile, you could browse your Xbox friend list to find people to play with. Sony's refusal to allow Xbox Live sign-ins within Minecraft and therefore support for the game's cross-platform version means it's unsurprising there's no sign of PlayStation here. Yeah, that's not surprising whatsoever. No. Not even due to that. Like, obviously, PlayStation's not going to allow Xbox Live to be on their platform. <laughs> but this Chivos. is fucking bonkers news. When I read this, on, I literally said, wait, what? Out I loud know, right? when I saw this. I, I've been trying to wrap my head around this. Like, what does this mean? And... 
I try to find some articles online where people give examples of like what this could entail because I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head around it. But this pl- this paragraph here kind of puts things in perspective. So they said, again, if you're playing Warframe on Nintendo Switch, you could earn Xbox achievements. Yeah, which is crazy. Or I mean, it's great. if you're playing Fortnite on mobile, you could browse your Xbox friend list to find people to play with. Because my first thought was, why would Nintendo allow that? Like what? Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously Nintendo gave them the go ahead because they went. Well, also be- Nintendo is like, we don't know what the fuck we're doing. <laughs> what, what could it possibly hurt? Can you guys just go ahead and show us how to do this? Thanks, how do we bye. do this? Yeah. So I'm excited to learn more about this and how this is beneficial to both parties. I mean, obviously for Xbox, it makes sense. But mm-hmm. how, do, how is it beneficial to Nintendo? I guess. Do you? You know, it's exciting to me. It has a, nothing to do with Xbox Live. Okay. What's exciting is the fact that Nintendo or like that Microsoft and Nintendo brokered a deal like this to begin with, because what secret squirrel me hopes is that there are other deals happening that are better, like Viva Pinata on Switch. I knew it. (laughs) And like that just makes me really stupidly happy, even though I know it's probably not true. But if they could make this happen, which is just weird, I have to imagine that. I'm hoping again, this is speculation, but like they're that they're working together closely in other ways too. Oh yeah. I just think it's really cool that we've seen Nintendo and Microsoft kind of, you know, they kind of banded together during the whole cross play shenaniganry, you know, like sharing pictures back and forth. And so it's, it's fun to see these two companies just kind of, you know, holding hands and skipping through the dandelions while there's, a- Oh my God. It almost makes yeah. me as happy as when Miyamoto comes to the Ubisoft conferences. Oh, what a gem. That man is so adorable. Yeah. I love it when people in the industry just get along. It makes me really happy. It does make me happy. It's good. When people are happy and get along, life is better. It's better than when it's all negative and sad. So, yeah, this is super interesting. So if you find folks out there listening, have some insight as to how this could work, let us know. Because I I am just, I don't know. Maybe it's the Sudafed high. That's what I'll blame it on. But I was like, what? What? Give me some more examples. Like, how is this good for Nintendo? Is it just because it incites more people to play on their Switch? Does this ultimately mean that maybe you can play some Xbox games on your Switch? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I It's weird for the Switch. I'm glad that they did it. Yeah. Um, but And I do maybe hope that they'll just be like, wait, can Xbox Live just be... Our service. Our service. <laughs> Yeah. Can you imagine if like some Nintendo shit came to like Game Pass and it worked on your Switch? It'd be bonkers Dude, amazing. Here is a super bonkers banana, crazy, crazy banana idea. I don't know why I say crazy banana. Oh, bananas is what people say. Yeah, bananas. Say. Okay. People say bananas. Right, right. What if, because Nintendo doesn't have like an achievement system or trophy system of their own. They got fuck all. They're like, fuck all y'all. What if Microsoft creates specific achievements for Nintendo games? Do you know what I mean? mean, Or do you mean just, yeah, like starts make basically adapts the Xbox achievement system to work for Nintendo games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if you're playing Mario Odyssey, right, you get an achievement for getting your first star or something like that. And then that would be crazy. I would be all for it because it's just weird and I like weird shit. (laughs) (laughs) And then Sony would be like, dang. Sony would be like, what the fuck is going on? Are you all smoking crack? <laughs> What's happening? You have to innovate. No, and, and I, I do like that because I know Sony is obviously in the lead. We all know Sony's kicking so much ass right now. It's not even funny. Totally. But it's definitely not due to their online service. No. So it's. <laughs> they, they, if you're going to partner with one of the two for online, it's going to be, be Xbox. Xbox. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, I think that's kind of the interesting thing about this generation is we've seen Sony kind of stick try and true to what they do. And they obviously have some great, exclu- fantastic exclusives. And, you know, out the gate, they marketed their system much better than Xbox did. We'll never forget. Xbox just tripped all over themselves. They just tripped all over themselves. So they haven't really needed to innovate that much. I mean, obviously, we have PlayStation VR and we have PlayStation Now and PlayStation Plus and all these awesome things. But it's interesting to see what Microsoft is doing to try to catch up and what direction they're going in. And I think this is just a result of that. And I think it's awesome. It's cool. Yeah. Totes. All right, right. Simon, you got this. Yeah, I do. Because it's about one of my favorite things. Favorite things. things. These are a few of my favorite things. Oh, you're so good at Um, singing. (laughs) <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Anthem post-launch and endgame content revealed. Oh my goodness gracious. So on Twitter, Anthem lead producer Ben Irving revealed details on the post-launch content release schedule for Anthem, which will, <laughs> which will, include, which will include the continuation of Anthem's story, the addition of guilds and leaderboards, an expanded progression system, new missions, events, and difficulty settings, and even more. According to Irving, Anthem's post-campaign narrative will kick off with a March 2019 update called Act 1 echoes of reality with act two and three scheduled to be detailed at a later date the echoes of reality update will include several key features including a new cataclysm event a new stronghold for players to conquer and some quality of life improvements cataclysms are time limited wow limited time world events i can read Got it's it. okay it's mostly that the light is over here and it's sort of blinding me blinded <laughs> Actually, by the let light. me move this over here She's oh, blinded. It's much better. Uh, which will alter the world and introduce various hazards, including powerful creatures and extreme weather. Once players have completed the campaign, they will be able to dig their teeth into challenges, contracts, free play, and strongholds, which will comprise a large part of Anthem's endgame. Challenges will be available on a daily, weekly, and even monthly basis, giving players several ways to obtain crafting materials and currency. Legendary contracts will also be made available for players hungry for more difficult multi-part adventures. Strongholds represent some of the longest and most difficult challenges in Anthem. Can attest to that based on the beta <laughs> or the, whatever the fuck that was called. Uh, and players will need to assemble a team to tackle them. Contracts will allow players to increase their reputation with different factions, granting them access to crafting blueprints. Well, there's, there's a lot here. So this feels very MMO light to me, which I dig. Okay. I'm into so it sounds like the first, like, just kind of rereading through some of this, the first post-campaign narrative is in March 2019, depending yes. on when that is, maybe like a month or so after the game releases. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is that, okay, what do you think about this? So is that normal for a game like this to get a new narrative a month after launch or even maybe less? I don't know. I don't know how long the um, campaign is supposed to be for this game. Do you? I don't know, but I'm, I don't know if they've given out any numbers because I don't know. But the post. I mean, I think a month. I, it, it can probably feel short to a lot of people, but then I also realize that they're going to try and keep people interested in it. Like March, things are coming. Other things are coming out. Mm -hmm. Other games are starting to release. We're That's starting to move very, into summer. Very true. I, so uh, I think. Yeah, I just went to Google to see if I can find a, a number or something there. I don't know if anything has been said. So yeah, so I guess I mean that, that's good because there are there are going to be people who obviously are going to do nothing but play this game, and I'm sure they're going to be itching for content. So it's great that they're coming out the gate with DLC, and they have looks like two extra pieces kind of primed and ready to be announced whenever they're ready. And then mm -hmm. the Cataclysm event, stronghold for players to conquer, quality of life improved. This is awesome. Yeah, I like the Cataclysm because they remind me. Of, I'm People are going to just fucking be like, shut the fuck up about Guild Wars no, 2. No, don't. But they remind me about, you know, <laughs> but Guild Wars 2 has like limited time world events. They're fun to do. Uh, so it's kind of reminds, I don't know, obviously, because these, these don't exist yet, but it reminds me of maybe what like the dragons spawning will be like, or maybe when they had, they had a world event in Guild Wars 2 where it changed like almost the entire map. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's probably more like that. I don't really know. But either way, awesome. I'm down and i think it's super cool that they're doing it it was awesome when guild wars 2 did it uh so yeah you're right that's actually I'm something still... that i'm really excited about too i used to play world of warcraft for a hot minute i played a lot i played that game a lot back in the day and was it um cataclysm that yeah. that came out and um stormwind was just completely demolished and it was changed and it's exciting to think that maybe that's the route they are gonna go right where they have these cataclysms and do you remember that video? Never mind. I'll talk. I'll tell you after the show. I don't want to. Okay. I, don't, I don't want to bash anyone. I'm not going to do it. Anyway, it's a, okay. so it's kind of funny. This is called Cataclysm. Anyway, that uh, it would be cool because I think the world of Anthem is interesting, but I think for it to remain interesting, it's going to have to grow and evolve and change, especially when you're doing like free play after the post campaign narrative. And it's like, OK, well, this is the same world I've seen over and over again. But these cataclysms sounds like the perfect way to keep things innovative and fresh. Maybe they just fucking demolish everything and maybe they fill it with beautiful pandas and buffalo Ooh. wings and that's your world of um, anthem. Yeah. yeah why not what i find interesting so uh i do think it's interesting that they're doing this also one of the things that the guild wars 2 developers had said 
that they regretted was they the way that they had built out the world and the world's story, they were sort of stuck with leaving their terrain in certain ways. So the end game area is called or O R R. Mm-hmm. And like you have to have it be a piece of shit because it's part of the way that the story goes. For anyone leveling up through 80, that world needs to be a piece of shit. Like it needs to look disgusting. Mm. Can never change. That's very much part of the That's lore. That's part of it. Yeah, that's just part of it. And so, and they were like, man, we really wish we didn't do that. Or like we made it more instanced. So I think it's really interesting that Anthem, most of what the quote unquote story and or changing bits are going to be are instanced. They are in your uh, Fort Tarsus area only, Mm. which means that anything super drastic can be done there, like in, in terms of a branching effect. And then... Um, you know, obviously world events can be done for, for everything, but I think it's really cool. Yeah. I want more. I want to know more. And more importantly, I want to run around in my javelin and stab things. Yes. Yeah. I'm really like a pretty, pretty ninja that I am. You are a pretty ninja and I'm a very sexy, big colossus. That's yeah, you are. You can colors. twerk. Girl. I can twerk. But like I've said, I'm really excited for Anthem. Um, the demo didn't really do anything for me that I played last weekend because I think what I'm most excited about is the content the narrative, the story, the characters, you know, the Bioware flair. Like, that's why I'm in this game. If this wasn't a Bioware game, I would be just mildly interested in it. You know, that's just the truth. But now, you know, because they're talking about all this post-game stuff, I'm, I'm, I want it. But we only have a few more weeks to go, Steimer. I know. But this, I mean, I also agree that the, the fucking test, whatever the hell, I forgot what they called it already. Um, VIP demo, demo. That's right. VIP demo. <laughs> I was like, what did they call it? They called it some bullshit marketing thing. Yep. And <laughs> uh, it doesn't do it. was the same thing I just talked about like five minutes ago. Where, like, yeah. Those things never do it for me because I want the experience of going from zero to exactly. whatever, right? Like, you need to have the ramp that has been designed for you versus just being thrown in at level 10. You're like, the fuck's going on? Yeah. Okay, cool. I guess whatever. We'll walk around. Oh, speaking of um, walking, I did read that they are giving you the option to move around faster in Fort Tarsus when the actual game releases. Thank God. I think it was Polygon put out an interesting article called like 19 things that it's going to be changing between the demo and the, and the actual game in Anthem. And that was one of the things. Oh, that's good. I mean, again, that demo had been branched off Right. earlier so it makes sense yes um so yeah i'm stoked for anthem i am excited to play it and now we can go on to a different story about completely unrelated things absolutely That's a, a little bit of a sort of bummer to end on but whatever um disney <laughs> admits that self-publishing games was never their strength this probably should have earning... been up there with the EA news. That's my bad. Yeah, we should have we should have bummered it out in the middle and then ended on Anthem, but that's okay. Okay. Um, at an earnings call on Tuesday, Disney CEO Bob Iger expressed that the Walt Disney Company hold absolutely no interest in returning to video games as they were never able to, quote unquote, demonstrate much skill when it comes to publishing them. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, I mean, you kind of have to... Give them a little bit of credit. Uh, Disney will remove themselves from publishing and instead focus on licensing. Iger goes on to explain, quote, we've had good relationships with some of those we're licensing to, notably EA and the relationship on the Star Wars properties. Have you had a good relationship Right? Anyways, uh, and we're probably going to stay on that side of the business and put our capital elsewhere. Also, that part was me interjecting, not part of the quote, clearly. (laughs) Um, Their NFC figure franchise... Disney Infinity was scrapped in 2016, closing down developer Avalanche Software and seeing an end to all self-publishing efforts with the additional closure of Disney Interactive Studios itself. This gaming purge continued in 2018 with the shutdown of Club Penguin Island and the selling off of Emoji Blitz to mobile game developer Jam City. Iger states, we're good at making movies and television shows and theme parks and cruise ships. That'll Fucking cruise that. ships. Uh, he also didn't say that. I said fucking cruise ships. Um, and the like. We've just never managed to demonstrate much skill on the side of publishing games. In 2013, Disney partnered with Electronic Arts, giving the developer exclusive access to the video game rights of the Star Wars franchise, notably responsible for Star Wars Battlefront 2. EA was also holding its earnings call at the same time as Disney, confirming that the new Star Wars game, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, would be out this year. Uh, Iger finishes with 
over the years, as you know, we've tried our hand at self-publishing. We've bought companies. We've sold companies. We've bought developers. We've closed developers. And we've found over the years that we haven't been particularly good at the self-publishing side. But we've been great at the licensing side, which obviously doesn't require that much allocation of capital. Oh, Can I just boy. read Bob Iger's quotes forever? Yeah, I know, right? They're pretty great. We're good at theme parks and cruise ships. But, you know, I, I love how it's like we're really good at TV and movies, which would make sense if he stopped there and then theme parks and then cruise. Ships. So funny. <laughs> like, wait, what? So as a little um, follow up to this, um, Warren Spector. So this this write up is from bleedingcool.com and it's called Epic Mickey Creator Responds to Disney's Comments About Past Games and Publishing. Aww. So this caught the attention of Warren Spector, longtime industry creator and current director of other site entertainment's Austin office, who at one point worked for Disney at Junction Point Studio. Spectre is the creator of Epic Mickey, a 2010 platformer for the Wii that received pretty favorable reviews at the time. Spectre had his own thoughts on the on games Disney previously published. He says, huh, I guess I should be insulted when Robert Iger says Disney has never been good at video games, but I'll just take the high road and stand proud with the Epic Mickey team and laud them for the great work that they, we, did for Disney. Uh, yeah, yeah and also disney infinity wasn't a bad game yeah i i i am going to go on a limb here and i'm going to make an assumption now ladies and gentlemen assumptions can be good but they can be very dangerous at the same time i mean they should they can be correct they can't i didn't mean good assumptions can be correct but they can be dangerous because you might be wrong and disney ceo bob Iger, i am wondering if he has no idea what's going on with the Star Wars situation and that whole contract and that whole chestnut. Unless, like what Steimer might say, is he's contractually obligated to maintain a good face and say happy things. No, not. I think it's more, this man doesn't fucking read the internet. Are you kidding me? Like, Bob Iger does not give a flying <laughs> fuck that people are mad <laughs> about, about Battlefront 2. What he is looking at is the P&L sheets for Battlefront 2. I imagine the game is profitable. So, yes, in that way, he's not wrong that it it's a favorable relationship. Um, but it's just more of like, oh, dear. Okay. Uh, yeah. it's just it seems a little out of touch which is again fair considering that this man is making movies and TV shows and theme parks and cruise ships and cruises what's a video <laughs> game right so he probably doesn't give a shit that much he's like look these licensing deals are the best for the company which yeah. is probably true oh yeah um, I mean so yeah, he's not wrong it's just sort of a weird way to go about saying it yeah and I think uh you know, I, obviously, there's a few people here are like scratching their their beer, scratching their head. I was gonna say rubbing their beard, scratching their head yeah. or rubbing their beard. Yeah, one or the other, maybe other hair in other places. Maybe, maybe body. both. Maybe both. Sure, that's even better than where I was going. Yeah. So obviously, you have the Disney employees who are not, or the the folks who worked on these Disney games before that are pro like Warren Spector is probably like, well, that kind of sucks. And then you have the members of the industry and consumers who are like, hey, you know, this Star Wars licensing deal really hasn't gotten you much of anything. And by this quote, it sounds like he's like, yeah, things are doing good. You know, we're, we're happy with EA. We've had good relationships, notably EA. So I think that's just kind of why it's making this the news right now, especially since there's just that last rumor that the game was scrapped yeah. and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it happens. No, say. And yeah, I mean, here, here's another thing. This is an earnings call. He's not going to sit here and trash EA. Oh, like, yeah. That's <laughs> like a good point. Not, that's not where you're not. Because like, you, you want people to feel good. These It's similar to like the Wilson call where if something's bad, you're going to throw someone else under the bus. Mm -hmm. And if something's OK, you're just not really going to mention the fact that it might be bad in some ways. You're okay. going to be like, nah, it's been fine. It's been fine. Everything's fine. Well, this is fine. Um, I'm try I was trying to find a news article to end on a high note, but the one thing I did find is that there's a Resident Evil 2 fixed camera mod and a first person <laughs> mod. So that's exciting. Oh my God. <laughs> I love that you found something Resident Evil related to end us on. <laughs> and I'm so sad because the DLC is coming out next Friday and I'm going to be gone. I'm going to miss it. <gasps> oh no, you're going to be on vacation. I, I mean, literally, I'm excited for this vacation, but I would not mind postponing this vacation so I can spend a day with this Resident Evil DLC. I'm thinking I might even just bring my PlayStation. You should just do that. Yeah. I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. Well, Sounds ladies good. and gentlemen, this was a nice, beefy, meaty uh, news segment. We are going to go into segment two, where Andrea is going to join me 
on video. Steimer is there in audio form. I I'm there in spirit. You're there in spirit. You're a voice in the abyss. <laughs> and we're going to talk about some Division 2. And then Steimer and I will talk about what else we've been playing. Stay it. tuned. We'll be right back if you're lucky. What's good, everybody, and welcome to the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast. I promise I'm not just going to be making these random appearances at the top of the <laughs> second segment of the show. Um, so as you can tell, I am still out of the country in Sydney. I'm in my friend's apartment right now. And Brittany and Steimer have been holding it down in the top of the show because I've been having some severe internet issues. And so we decided to not attempt to do the entire show together, sadly, but we did want to sneak in our hands-on impressions for the Division 2, the preview event that Brittany and I went to. But, ladies, before we get to that, we have a couple of important announcements. First, this hands-on impression segment is brought to you by our second sponsor of the show, Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that finds and delivers clothes, shoes, and accessories to fit your body, your budget, and your lifestyle. Just go to stitchfix.com slash what's good and tell them your sizes, what styles you like, and how much you want to spend on each item. You'll be paired with your very own personal stylist, mine is named Casey, she's great, who will handpick items to send right to your door. Then you simply try them on, pay for what you love, and return the rest. Shipping, exchanges, and returns are always free, and there's no subscription required. You can sign up to receive scheduled shipments or get your fix whenever you want. That's what I do, because sometimes I need my fix every two weeks, and sometimes I need it every two months. You know, it changes throughout the year. Stitch Fix's styling fee is just $20, you guys, and that's applied towards anything you keep from your shipment, which is an awesome feature of Stitch Fix. I'm anxiously awaiting the, a box that I got a notification from that should have arrived by the time I get home tomorrow. Ooh. We'll see. I asked uh, I asked for a dress to bring to Dice, so we'll see what they give me. Oh, that's exciting. Um, if you, I know, isn't it? Um, so keep your fingers crossed that they send me something really fun. If you guys want to get excited about shipments coming right to your door, go to stitchfix.com slash what's good, and you'll get an extra 25% off when you keep all of the items in your box. That's stitchfix.com slash what's good to get started today. One more time, stitchfix.com slash what's good. Oh, yeah. So what's, what's up, Brit? Well, oh, yeah. If you're, if you're watching at youtube.com slash what's good games, you might be like, where the fuck did Steimer go? Well, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, am I not even in the corner? <laughs> no, you're nowhere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You are well, literally non-existent no. right now. Okay. Um, because of some internet. I exist in my heart. In, in all of our hearts as well. <laughs> um, yeah, because of some internet issues, we are using a different program right now to shoot than we normally do. And it has this thing where it likes to switch back and forth between people. And we can't have that because that makes framing very hard. So Steimer was yeah. a champ. And she's like, I'll just be very small. But she didn't know that actually means <laughs> she'll be non-existent. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe I'm so small that I'm like microscopic small on the screen you just can't see me <laughs> exactly so but the good news is if you're listening on your favorite podcast service and hopefully you've subscribed to what's good games you can still hear her beautiful voice oh yeah yeah and isn't that the most important part it is it's i don't know not sometimes a... oh i was <laughs> I trying know. to be I was, all cute i was like wait a minute <laughs> do i have a beautiful voice do you like do you like the way i speak <laughs> <laughs> all the time um by the way i haven't gotten a chance to tell you because i was going to tell you at the top of the show but now that i'm not in the top of the show anymore um you guys did a fantastic job last week and um i had a lot of fun listening to the show with alana thank yeah, you thanks, boo. the high five thanks oh so fun i need we need to get that girl back on we she and i talked about doing a segment where we just talk about dragon ball characters we'd bang I mean, it seems like the internet was very excited about that when oh, you yeah. guys were talking about it. So, I mean, go for it. Let's oh, uh, let's set that up. Set it uh, set it in stone, man. <laughs> <laughs> My best life. <laughs> All right. Well, before we digress too much, um, we also have to do something that is one of our favorite parts of the month. 
we get to read out our awesome Turbo Patron names for your monthly shout out. Oh, yeah. So thank you so much to everybody who supports us at patreon.com slash what's good games. If you want to get your name read aloud on the podcast and on youtube.com slash what's good games every month, then you've got to help support us. Click that pledge button and join our fantastic community over on Patreon. Um, so now we're going to read your names. And once again, please forgive us if we mispronounce them. We're going to. <laughs> and with the weird internet delay, we're probably going to s- talk over each other as well. So mm-hmm. apologies again for that, too. Who wants to start? I'll start with Aaron right. Saxton. Adrian Iraq Williams. And then Alberto. Goes. I was like, who's going in which order? What's happening? <laughs> Alberto Andreas Videla. Alex Rigopoulos. Andrew and Ampersand. I don't think there's supposed to be a name there. I don't know what happened. I don't know. It's just the way of the world. I don't know, but we got another Andrew, but this guy is Andrew Cotton. And we got an Andrew Smith. And an Andrew Susan. We're just all Andrews up in here. <laughs> and then Anthony Murphy. Ariella Furman. Bill Stillwell. Billy Shibley. Brian Harper. I'm going to say everyone's name in a really bad Valley Girl name from now on. Perfect. Brian R. Johnston. Brooke Lurie Asia Harris. Carl Peterson. <laughs> Kathy Lucas. Chris Wilson. Cool Rat Daddy. David Aikulucci. Donato Sinaccio the third. Dustin Lewis. E. Benjamin Checkness. E. Izari. Eli. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Brooke. Elmo Shell. Emily Kent. Emma Acorn. Eric Sarney. Eric Guerrero. Ferris and Ty. Geek Heart Games. Geo Carsey. <laughs> Gregory Horton. Ivan Bejarano. Jared Howard. Jasmine Lee. Jason Davis. Jason Kerr. Jay Mahui. Jason Dimmers. I'm a loser. Jesse Spencer. <laughs> You're not a loser, Jason. Jessica Bloom. Uh, Joe Kennison. Josh Leaf. John Drake. Joselle Bassa. Justin Foshi. Justin Foss. Kevin Dunkel. Kia B. Lincoln Davis. Lincoln Thurber. Lucas Shaney. <laughs> Mark Drastrup. Martha Emery. <laughs> Matthew Goder. Matthew Simpson. Melanthius Owens. Michael Shanholtz. Mike Queen. Mohammed Mohammed. Malay Abetner. Nam Bui. Nicole Humphrey. I need a life. Noelle Never Neverez. This sounds funny every time you do it though. Ozzy Mahia. Paige Porter. Patrick Landry. Patrick Weller. Pete Shoemaker. Like Professor Metal Gear. Punctified. Pure Blue Octopus. Blah, 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 blah. RJ Bryan. <laughs> Regan Imsen. Rob Leonard. Roland Bala. Ross Haney. Ryan B. Sam. Sean I. Simon Bergstead. Sian Stevenson. Seth Wu. Stephanie Fitzwilliam. Stephen Chong. Stephanie DuPont. Sydney Carr. Tara Bruno. Timu Nikonen. Teresa Enert. The Right Game with the W. Ooh, like write, like write a book. Yeah. Timothy Bennett. Tommy Larson. Tony, oh God. Ahem. Shay. Yeah, that. Tony <laughs> Shay. <laughs> <laughs> Trent Berry. Trent Pennington. Trevor Starkey. Pat McCall. William Collum. Will Hernandez. And Zach Hershey. Yes. Thank you so much to all of our Turbo patrons and above. You guys are the bee's knees. And once again, if you want to get involved and hear us read your name in Brit's weird Valley Girl accent, yeah. patreon.com slash what's good games. All right. So as much as I am going to go a little crazy not getting to talk to Brittany about Kingdoms of Bob Miller Reckoning, we're going to have to put a pin in that. Um, let's talk a little bit about The Division 2. 
So Brittany and I got invited by Ubisoft to go to a preview event in San Francisco um, a couple weeks ago. And hopefully you heard our interview with Julian Garrity, who is the creative director at Massive, of course, the development studio within Ubisoft, who is creating The Division 2. And now we get to talk about what we played. So we had some pretty lengthy hands-on time, probably about four or five hours total with the game. Would you say, Brent? Is that right? Yeah, at least. We had a lot of time. Yeah, so we played a couple different things. We played on our own for a little bit, um, and then we teamed up with people, and then we did some end game content where we um, did a mission that was super high level. Like I think it was level thirty. Yeah, that sounds right. The level at which um, you get your ass kicked. Yeah, where we got to try out the specialists, which are the three selectable uh, weapons and kind of um, abilities that go with them. Once you finish the main campaign, it kind of like unlocks like a, almost like a prestige or like a new game plus type experience. So, um, Brittany, you got to play it at E3 too, didn't you? I did. For oh god, it was only like ten minutes or so of gameplay I got. Um, and at that time, my impression was it feels just like the division. Obviously, it looked prettier. The setting was more interesting, and the grass physics were top notch. The developers were like, "Look at the grass. Look at the way it folds when you walk on top of it." And I was like, "Oh, the that's grass physics." That's you were like, "Oh yeah, that's what turns me that's on." That's real you sexy, know. right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, the grass does look really fantastic. Of course, the Division Two set in Washington D.C. versus in New York, and even that little bit of a scenery change, I think, really helps make the game more uh, visually interesting and doesn't feel so samey. But I did feel like I wanted a scooter. I just- oh yeah. Really wanted a scooter, and it was something that was a question I was supposed to ask Julian about, and I completely That's forgot. Nice. I had a giant list of questions for Julian because you guys so graciously sent a bunch of them, but we had so little time with him because he was very busy talking to lots of different members of the press that day. But um, I think we're going to get a chance to talk to him and some other members of the team again uh, before the game releases. So I will ask about it, but. That was one of the things I hated about the original Division, even though I, I really like that game. It's just like I felt like I was running constantly, and I was just like, oh, I want to get there faster. Yeah, that was also a complaint of mine, too. And I wonder if, they, if they're if they not putting in a means of transportation. Is it because they want you to have all those encounters with all of those freakers? Not freakers. That's taste gone. All the enemies. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's fucking Sudafed high. I am on a Sudafed. I am in the clouds right now, ladies and gentlemen. It's very beautiful. You should see Earth from this angle. It's gorgeous. But, <laughs> yeah, I wonder they want you to have all those encounters because otherwise yeah if, i mean it's beautiful but it just feels so samey especially in the division you know you're just walking down these streets and there are buildings everywhere and then you run into peep to bad guys and then buildings and then bad guys and it didn't feel that different this time around either even though it is in dc and yeah. it's summertime mm-hmm. it, no uh, no parkas it was so no funny parkas. because i was thinking specifically of you steimer when i asked <laughs> Julian about the customization and the and the wares and he said that there will be like an homage to the parkas from the division <laughs> in, in some of the stuff that you'll get to see but it's lots of shorts lots of tank tops and shorts <laughs> they were like wait summertime makes our options much more variety or varied let's do yes. that yes exactly <laughs> Um, but the game looks great. The the graphics uh, looked awesome. We were playing on Xbox One X's, and I don't remember what the settings were for the monitors that we were playing, but I have to imagine they were either 1080p or 4K. But, I mean, you guys know the game is going to look good. Ubisoft does a fantastic job when it comes to their art team, so no worries about that. And it played really well, too. I mean, obviously we had a couple technical hiccups here and there, but it's hard to judge what the final build is going to be like in such a distinct networked environment at a press event. So I don't want to ding them for some hangups that we had in matchmaking in such a weird setting. But uh, what do you think of the way that the co-op worked in the missions, Britt? Did you like the gunplay? Did you like the loot system? Well, we were playing with, oh my gosh, what was her name? Um someone so we were playing it was yeah. yes it was and yeah i think it was from, from fandom i need to look i need to look it up yeah 
she was incredible. So typically, oh my gosh, she was so good. Oh man, I've never played with someone like that at first. So she obviously knows what the hell she's doing. She's like, okay, she knew all of our little our names that we had. I didn't even know my own. I think I was Delta. I didn't even know until Andrea was being shot to shit. You she's, were you were Charlie. Oh, sh- oh see, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, Charlie, I need help. Charlie, hey Charlie, and I'm like Andrea, go help your damn self. And I'm like, oh wait, I'm Charlie. Yeah, I'm oh bravo. shit, I'm Bravo. <laughs> See, oh I don't God. even know. And so, like, who am I? I'm having oh. an identity crisis. <laughs> am I Charlie Bravo Delta? I don't fucking know. But uh, so she made it. She kind of brought the whole experience to a whole new level because typically it's just Jason and I who play like online shooters with together in the wee hours of the morning, and I just run in and I get myself shot up. Then he revives me, rinse, wash, repeat. But she's like, "Okay, you guys take the top level. We're gonna take the bottom level." And the way she coordinated everything just made so much sense. And I was like, "Oh, is this what good players play like all the time? Is this why they're so good?" <laughs> it yes. was an awesome experience. <laughs> Yeah, she took the squad-based mechanics to a whole new level by really taking her job as alpha leader very seriously, which I really appreciated. Um, and like Brittany said, like, in addition to calling out specific directions, she would be like, "There's I, I count seven tangos up ahead. And I was like, yes, you're the best. Um, <laughs> Stepping in character, I love it so much. Um, but it really helped us to be able to coordinate the use of our um, – our special abilities. So they've kind of uh, revamped some of the abilities that we had in the first game. So like the Seeker drone or the Seeker mine is back, but they've kind of uh, changed it up a little bit. They have a new drone and I spec mine for healing to be a support drone instead of to be an attack drone, which is really nice. So if I was getting low on armor, I could either throw my drone out to heal myself or I could send it over to Brittany all the time (laughs) to heal her. (laughs) No, it's true. And it makes this buzzing noise. And I always thought this always sounded like there was a bug like buzzing around me because I was always getting fucking shot up. And I didn't realize that was Andrea's drone until like the end of the demo. And I'm like, oh, thanks, baby girl. You did me a good one. Oh, it's been helping me this whole time. (laughs) I know. Yeah, exactly. Um, So that was really cool to be able to work with the team and have uh, constant communication to be able to take out some of the enemies because, you know, one of the tough parts about the division is the barrier to entry and the difficulty. It felt like a lot of the enemies were very bullet spongy and there was just wave after wave after wave of them. So it really, in order to be successful in the division, you really have to take advantage of everything that's in your arsenal from the different weapons that you're carrying to the different gear that you have. Um, and of course, you know, utilizing those special abilities that we were talking about. Now, in our interview with Julian, we talked about gear score since that was a really important thing for high level division players is the min maxing of how do I get my gear score to its ultimate level. And he said that it's, going to function much like it did in the first game for the division two but then of course you know they've added in you know different types of gears and different ways to kind of um optimize your character's layout or your loadouts excuse me but yeah there are loadouts oh, yeah, there <laughs> which you is go. also fun but what did you think about some of the end game stuff that we got to see, Brit? Some of the stuff that uh, I believe people are looking at in the private beta this weekend. Mm. Yeah. Um, the high level stuff. So it was really cool. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Ubisoft and their events team because they had the whole area set up like a base of operations. It was, looked so fucking cool. And they had these little projections on the little windows in the bank area. It was the bank, right? That's where we were. Yeah, they set it up to look like the White House, which is your base of operations in D.C., yeah. of course. Yeah, <laughs> and so we went down for lunch, and we came up, and then the event org- organizers were like, okay, just stand in this little area for a second, and we're all wondering, like, okay, because we know we have to get back to the demo, and then they start doing, like, gunshots and, like, flashes, and it looks like some shit's going down outside. It was really cute, and then they ushered us into the high-level content at our stations. It was just adorable, and I appreciated it. Um, so that was – so here's the thing. I've talked about this. I'm not good at accuracy. I'm not good where I have to shoot people in the head is, or shoot people in general. So this high-level stuff is no joke. If you enjoy you know, a challenge, if you enjoy shooting things where it actually matters if you shoot them in the head, this is going to be great for you. Shooting things accurately, you mean? Yeah, that too, because uh, it's tough. 
I, I obviously struggled, but typically my play style is I like to hide a lot more and peek my head out and then shoot things and then like retract back in. But when you're playing with professionals like Jada and Andrea, and I don't know about if I'd call Greg a, a professional, you kind of got to roll with the, what yeah. with <laughs> roll with the punches <laughs> and you got to like, okay, stick yourself out there. So I did and I got my ass kicked, but it was really, it was fun really fun and I liked how you did feel more powerful at that level and I know you got a whole bunch of other um, specialties you could dink around with but unfortunately you know because they just threw you right into the demo I didn't get a chance to actually learn how they work because the first specialty I had was a uh, a turret and that's pretty self-explanatory but when they dropped us into the high level stuff it was it looked like I had to manually tell it where I wanted to shoot it or something like that so I didn't really get to mess around with it but obviously you unlock a lot cooler stuff at that level too and you unlocked the grenade launcher as your specialty as the demolitionist and um right. i picked yeah i picked the survivalist with the crossbow but i remember that we got pulled away uh to go do our interviews mm -hmm. so we didn't actually get to find the specialty ammo that you need in order to fire those weapons so we kind of had a little bit of a a a not representative experience with the end game content that everybody else maybe did, and um, I'm hoping to maybe sneak a little bit of time in with the the closed beta that's happening to check it out a little bit more because I feel like we didn't get to see enough of that end game content. But I just got excited when I opened up my gear menu. You see all like the orange and the purple yeah. gear versus like the blue gear. The you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that that RPG loot grind. Can they, can you, uh, customize what you look like similar to Assassin's Creed, how they fixed that? Did they do that? Is that just With implemented? The, trans the transmogrification, yeah. you mean? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think so. I don't think so. Um, Come on, Ubisoft. That, yeah, that's not something we ask them about, but we can, when we talk to them again, uh, we can ask if that's going to be something that is de maybe down the line, like post-launch. Um, we did talk to, to them about the new PvP stuff, so the thing that they're pushing with the Division 2, of course, is three separate Dark Zone areas and organized PvP modes, because that was the biggest thing their community said, was like, hey, we really want PvP, and they noticed that people were going rogue very often in the Dark Zone because they were looking for that you know, player versus player interaction, they just weren't getting it, so they were just making it up on their own. Mm -hmm. And so in order to kind of bring the Dark Zone back to its original vision. They've expanded what it was, and then they have also added these new modes that are going to have exclusive gear that you can only earn in the PvP modes. So that was a, a big thing that Julian talked to us as well, because I know as a longtime Destiny player, that's a big draw for a lot of people to play things like the Iron Banner or a certain Crucible playlist because they can get specific you know, gear or weapons just by playing that. And I think that's a good lure or carrot or whatever you want to call it for people who maybe weren't interested in the Dark Zone, like me. Like, I hated the Dark Zone. I hated the idea that somebody on my team could turn around or shoot me and steal my stuff. Like, yeah. no thanks, I'm good. Um, but I'm happy that it exists for the people that want it. Yeah, those <laughs> monsters. No, I, I think <laughs> yeah. I even told Julie, I was like, those monsters. And he defended all of you. He said, hey, they are an important part of my player base, so I can't talk shit about them. And I was like, you're right. You can't. But, but we can. We can. We can, <laughs> but it's ill-advised. Yeah. I would say another question we got a lot was, can people just hop into it if they never played the first division? And obviously, we didn't. Did we start from the, we didn't start from the very beginning, but I'm assuming the answer is yes. I'm assuming that it's a self-contained story. Obviously, it takes place after the first one. But it's not like you're you're gonna be thrown in. It's not like you're hopping into Kingdom Hearts three, right? Where you're like, honestly, what the yeah. fuck? even the story in the Division one, I don't remember being terribly invested in. There's a dis it's a whatever in New York disease in New York. You're like, okay, someone betrays someone, well, and yeah, yeah. I'm with you, Steimer. I didn't think that the story was particularly gripping. I don't even remember most of the main characters' names, um, but I think that they heard that feedback and have expanded the world. What I really like about what they're doing narratively with the Division 2 is adding in factions, both friendly and violent factions, and how you as the character need to use them to your advantage. So you want to help out people on the street, much like you did in the Division, but the stakes are higher this time around because you have a vested interest in making sure a faction thrives or dies. 
right? So you want to eliminate So you have like the- help someone in a, of a certain faction and that increases your faction points. You could get gear from them, I assume. Is it similar to that? Go to that faction for supplies or you can go to that faction for help and you'll run into those various faction members on the street. Like, for example, when Britt and I were playing, we ran across four people from a friendly faction that were out looking for water. And so you can choose to like walk along with them and help defend them as they're out scavenging for supplies or you can choose to just, you know, run on by and not do anything. Um, it's it's really interesting how they really wanted to expand on the narrative by making it more personal and saying, hey, these aren't just random people on the street of New York who are looking for like a granola bar and are going to give you a pair of pants, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> they're, they wanted to make them mean something more than they did in the first game. And I think that that was a really wise move. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And overall, I would say it just it feels like the division, a more polished version of it. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not trying to I know there's a lot more content that, I mean, the content they have planned for this game is just unreal. And I think that's awesome. But in terms of how it plays, I, I would say I'm a casual division player. You know, I just play the campaign and this felt familiar, but in a good way. It didn't feel like oh, I'm just doing the same shit over and over again. And it, so, I mean, if you like the division, you're going to love the division, too. I think that's like the t- main takeaway here. Yeah, there's just one other thing I wanted to add about about the, the division. And so at the very end of our conversation, I snuck in a question to Julian about the raids. So they've talked about how the raids are going to be eight-person raids. And I was like, is there going to be matchmaking? And he pretty much said, no, there won't be. And I said, listen... It's hard enough for me to get the clan together with six people in Destiny for raids. Getting eight people together is going to be even more challenging. And while I completely understand from a gameplay design perspective, you want to make sure that people are communicating in high-level endgame content like a raid. At the same time, I'm like, eight people is a lot of people to get together for one piece of gameplay content, you know? Mm -hmm. Or uh, do you guys think that I'm being unreasonable? Do you think that's easy to do? No, I don't think it's easy to do. I mean, then again, you're no, talking to I someone. No, I think, who... I mean, Go. any other game where with high-end content, I uh, I mean, MMO, sorry, uh, there's ways to fill the group. <laughs> right. Like, so I think that they should, I mean, if they want to have something where it's, where they know that a decent amount of people are at least partied up, that's one thing. So if it's like minimum of four people in one party or whatever bullshit, whatever you want to do, fine. But like you do need to give people some sort of option to fill. Cause like, can you imagine how fucking annoyed you'd be if you had seven people who wanted to do it and you couldn't do it because you needed one more? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I would be like, what is going on? No, no. Just put in yeah. recording. It's fine. Just good in-game reporting systems will help weed the bad people out. Yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully they change their minds and add matchmaking later on um, because, as I mentioned, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging, oh. yeah. I was I was quiet because I was wondering, well, you could put bots in. I'm like, no, actually, bots would suck. Bots no, probably, bots are terrible. Yeah, the AI. As somebody who played a ranger in Guild Wars 2 and therefore had a bot as my pet that did it a majority, like, not a majority, but your pet does a decent amount of damage in PvE, does jack all in endgame content because it fucking dies. <laughs> well, there you go. You heard it here so first. No, I don't want, I don't want any bots. <laughs> no bots for Steimer. <laughs> but shit's too well, hard. Well, uh, I, listen, I'm with you. I agree. Like Britt said, takeaway was the game is fun. It definitely looks like a better version of The Division, and that's what you would expect out of a sequel. And you can expect us to definitely spend some more time with it, both in the closed beta that is happening, and um, I think we're going to get hands-on time with it one more time before launch, which feels far away, but really is only a month away now, which is kind of crazy to think about. I don't know where this time's going, man. That's, that's such know. an old person thing to say, but it's fucking true. <laughs> Out the window. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, what my dad always said was it gets faster every year you get older. Yeah, I've heard that so too. So enjoy it while you're young. That's horrifying. <laughs> right? I don't like that at all. It's kind of true, though. It is. I know. It is. That's, But I still don't like it. <gasps> We're going to be 90 and do it. We're going to do it. What's good game? I don't know. That's an old person <laughs> voice. It's just like it's like on high speed. <laughs> We're just talking real fast because we don't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Amazing. Well, listen, ladies, this has been really fun. Um, I'm going to say goodbye now and let you talk about the rest of what you've been playing and finish off the show. Um, but thanks so much for letting me call in from Sydney. And I look forward to listening to you guys talk about that whopper of a news segment that oh I looked at the show notes. Oh, boy. There's a lot going on there. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And hopefully I'll be able to reconnect with you both Shortly, of course, next week I'll be at the Dice Awards in Las Vegas for the Dice Summit for the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. Um, I think that is live streaming on their Twitch page. I'll be sh I'll be tweeting all the details if you guys want to watch the award show live. It's 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, February 13th. I know that's kind of late for some of our friends both on the East Coast and across the pond in the UK, but. I guess they are like, hey, it's Vegas. We don't want to make it too early. There you I don't go. know. That's, that's the Vegas logic. <laughs> well, hey, go ride a kangaroo. Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what you Give that a go. <laughs> Give that a go. See how, it, see how it goes and get your ass back soon. We miss you. I will. All right. Thanks, ladies. Bye. 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 Why? thank you, Andrea, for that amazing Division Two conversation with myself and Steimer. Again, this is one of those invisible timer. Yeah, invisible timer. This is one of those awkward things where that was pre-recorded, and so now we're trying to act like it was just seamless. Oh my god, so nonchalant, so good, so we're like good. so natural, oh, such this. professionals. All right. Oh my god, that was a lot of Division Two talk, and it was exciting because Division Two is shaping up and looking to be really fun. But Steimer, mm. I see you, my dear. Have mm. you played much more Kingdom Hearts Three? You know, I cleared a little bit more of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I don't have, honestly, like, any much more to say about it, though, than, like, kind of agreeing with Alana, and that I think it's, it's, I mean, I think if you're a Kingdom Hearts fan, you're gonna love the shit out of it, because I think people who are in that fandom mm -hmm. should love this, but as someone who has zero idea what's happening, sure, this is not a game not that i would recommend you pay 60 dollars for because i still don't know what the fuck is going on or what these people are on about and the gameplay while f like fun for a bit and mindless like sort of mindless button mashing kind of and also my favorite part about it is at some point you unlock the um attraction Ooh. uh attacks oh so you're literally like a fucking pirate ship attacking or a carousel mm -hmm. or whatever like they're different things i love those because they're batshit insane this and i love to, hold on i, I got it this goes to show you where my mind is you said attraction and i was thinking of like a bio or romance attraction oh i was like that doesn't sound like something that would be in kingdom hearts but oh yeah baby and then i got confused Attract me when you talked about pirate ships then i'm like right you were like, are you sexually attracted to pirate ships? That's you know, we weird. We were talking about this in the last segment, being attracted to physical objects, and it, sometimes it happens. But you know, it, yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting. But yeah, so like those attacks are fun and interesting, but I will say, control wise, I think a lot of them are really wonky mm -hmm. and it's confusing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like there's this one power that I was using. And Pegasus from Hercules comes and you're in a chariot. And dear God, it controls like garbage. I was just like, what the like fuck the is Mako happening? Like the in Mass Effect I was garbage. so confused. I'm just going. And so, yeah, you're like, it's, it, was, it just controlled really badly. Um, but this is a game I will continue to play until Crackdown comes out. Okay. And then I'm going to stop playing it. Okay. Because this is the game that I can sit in my house after work play not have to think too hard about it because i'm not paying attention to what they're saying uh, they're just talking about hearts mostly which makes sense because that's in the title and you know disney <laughs> characters are there which i like disney a lot oh my god and i'm interested in and you can switch gear out and do whatever fun stuff. like it's got mechanics okay. that i would theoretically enjoy i just think the fact that i have no idea what's going on and the fact that the gameplay to me currently does not seem good enough to keep my interest for a very long period of time mm. um i don't think this would be a game that i would finish but i'm enjoying what i'm playing enough. hey there you go yeah and we got a lot of not a lot that's an exaggeration maybe like half a dozen comments in youtube saying you know some are being serious some are being cheeky that we're kingdom hearts haters and it's like 
listen. I don't know. Yeah, you go on with your bad self. You love Kingdom Hearts. You fucking love Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, and go I think it. it's just important to remember that, you know, we've been very transparent that we're not Alexa Ray, obviously. She's the queen of Kingdom Hearts, the elected queen of Kingdom Hearts. And we don't know much. As many times as you talked about it, it fucking doesn't stick because it doesn't make any sense to us. So, you know, we're going into this expecting this to be a game that, you know, would release in 2019 that maybe has been in development. Someone in the comments also said that the game's been in development for five years after it being scrapped. Um, I don't know the whole history of it. I'm not going to pretend to. But we're not trying to shit on this thing that you love so much. It's just these are our no. opinions, you know, from people who don't know a lot about the game. We're just it's telling true. you. That's all. Um, I have been playing. What do you want to talk about, Britt? I don't know. I have, I have a few things I want to talk about. Um, okay, I'll talk about Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. So this is a game that came out in 2012, I think, a lo- 2012, a long time ago. It was a while ago. Yeah, I think yeah. almost seven years ago it came out. Um, and I played it on PC back in the day, but t- typically when I play games on PC, it just doesn't stick. And I don't think I put more than maybe three to four hours in it. But what I did play has, you know, it left a lasting impression on me. And I was sick all weekend, um... And when I'm sick, I just kind of crave something, you know, that you can kind of lose yourself in. Something that's not super stressful, something kind of magical, fantasy-like. And Kingdoms of Amalur has been on my mind ever since it was announced that THQ Nordic bought the rights in September, I think it was. They bought the rights back in September. And it's now on Xbox back, bat, wait, was it back, combat? back, cattle, back, pat. Back pat. Back. <laughs> That's it. Back, back to back. Back compat. So it's on there. Back compat. I think it's $20. So I, uh, with my box of Kleenex and my cough drops and my blanket, I downloaded this game. And I think I've stuck maybe 10 to 12 hours into it so far. And it is so much fun. I I am so amazed for being seven years old how well this game holds up. The only thing about it that doesn't hold up is the way it looks because it's a Mm seven-year-old game. But all of the features it has and the conversation trees and the choices you can make and the inventory and your skills and the RPG mechanics of allotting skill points, it's just so good. It is such a good game, and I hope that THQ Nordic does something with these rights and if they can follow this formula like holy shit it almost reminds me of like Zelda and a Bioware game into one. Oh, interesting yeah yeah because it, it has like that fantasy sense of, of a Zelda game not much, you know Bioware is more kind of like realistic besides like the dragons and shit but like Zelda has like these pastel <laughs> colors besides the dragons and the aliens and the aliens and- you know the other not realistic shit in those games <laughs> But yeah, it has like the fun pastel colors. It has interesting characters, fun dialogue choices. The writing's great. And I'm, I'm just loving every single minute of this game. So I am super happy that I started playing it even if it's seven years later. So if you ladies and gentlemen have not played this game, 20 bucks on Xbox One um, X and uh, X, Xbox One. And I, I would recommend it. I think it's a beefy game. I think it, uh, yeah. I've, I've been doing a lot of exploring. It's a, it's a honker. Yeah, a lot of exploring. And I zoomed out of the map and I was like, oh, I'm only maybe like a sixth of the way through this map. Tons of side quests and just, it's all fun stuff. And the combat is so satisfying. Anyway, I'm super duper excited about it. And Andrea, nice. I think, has played it. I don't know if she finished it, but I know yeah. for sure she's a fan of it as well. Because in the show notes, she wrote, Jelly. Or was that you, Simer? That was her. I'm no, it wasn't me. That was her. Yeah. I wrote Jealous of the Division too. Ah, yes. There's two Jealous comments in here. All right. Yes. What is Glass Masquerade? So. Oh. Glass Masquerade. Oh, boy. I feel like we need dramatic music playing right now. Glass Masquerade. Uh, oddly enough, this was a game that actually came through my What's Good Games email, oh. which, uh, as you know, I very rarely check. Yeah. So I saw a press release for this game, read about it, and went, yes, I would like to play this game. Okay. So Glass Masquerade is essentially jigsaw puzzles. Oh, I'm looking and, at it right now. And it's beautiful because it's a lot. It's stained glass, sort of mm-hmm. a stained glass aesthetic. It's all clock faces, which I don't understand why, but that sure. Whatever. You do you. Whatever floats your boat. Um, and it's the music and the background is incredibly beautiful and relaxing. And so this is the game that I now play before I go to bed. Ooh. And I just sit there with my Switch and I solve a few puzzles until I'm tired as shit. And then I go to sleep. And it's been really actually helping me sleep through the night somehow. I don't know why. But maybe just like working, having your brain do some sort of mental exercise mm-hmm. and then 
wanting to pass out is helpful. I'm not sure, but this, it was literally exactly what I wanted. I'm like, I want a puzzle game. That's not like super obtuse. I know what a jigsaw puzzle is. Everybody knows what a jigsaw puzzle is. I know what I'm supposed to do here, but it still takes thought and effort. And um, so it's just a really like beautiful, relaxing game. If you're looking to something like for something to just sip your tea with at the end of the night, that's that's what I've been doing, and I have been thoroughly enjoying myself. I will say the one sticking point I have is mostly that I was just an idiot slash really tired <laughs> the first time that I fired up this game, and the tutorial is literally a box that says the red pieces with circles will match cir- like mm. will line up with circles or some shit, and I was like, what? I was like, wait, what the fuck is happening? And it turned like I because I did not notice that on the clock face itself there were very tiny circles indicating oh. that you drag the puzzle piece and match it up to a spot that it would fit with alongside one of those circles but dumb ask me i literally went and looked up on youtube i was like what the fuck how what is happening <laughs> i was so confused and then i saw it and went oh, I'm oh. An idiot. we all have those okay. moments <laughs> we all have those moments where like oh my god did this really yeah. just happen? Now I'm looking at it on uh, Nintendo's. Do you ever use the touch screen? Yes. Okay. I don't. I don't use it a lot. I I do tend to like grab with. Uh, you just like push A mm-hmm. and then move the piece around with the with the nubbins. The nubbins. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at the Nintendo page right now. It's an artistic puzzle game inspired by Art Deco. Deco. I don't fucking know how to say. It. It's Art Deco. Art Deco. Thank yeah, you. Right. Art Deco and stained glass artisans of the 20th century combine hidden glass pieces to unveil clocks and themes exhibited by various cultures of the world. Yeah. 25 puzzles. This is awesome. This looks. Yeah. Great. I really am enjoying it. And again, it is the perfect unwind game. That's that's awesome, especially if it's helping you sleep at night. It's crazy how certain games can really just stimulate a part of your brain that you didn't really know needed to be stimulated to relax and unwind <laughs> you. That's what she said. Because, yeah. Nightmare, you see, I have one of those games, too. And mm. this is my Brit segue. Brit way? Anyway. Yeah, your Brit way. My Brit way. Let's go. Brit way, let's go. And those are farming sims. I've talked about them at length on the show. And I am getting to the point where I'm, like, getting the shakes. I need a fucking farming sim bad it's been <laughs> i don't know when story I of need season fix. i think it was like okay, trio of towns that was the last story of season game i played and that was out i think in 20 2017 so february 28th 2017 so it's been almost two years timer since oh i've God. had my my farming fix and i've tried other like actually that's that's not true story i play, played stardew valley i think after that yeah. So maybe later that year I played Stardew Valley. I think it was later in 2017. Anyway, it's been a hot minute and I'm getting the shakes. And Story of Seasons games just are my ultimate relaxation. I mean, I can play that and spend hours and hours and all of like thoughts and stressors just completely melt away. So in my desperate attempt to find a game that, you know, will fulfill that void, I found a game called Farm Together on Nintendo Switch. Mm-hmm. And this game has been on Steam. And in fact, my uh, aunt told me about it a couple months ago on Steam because she's the one who got me into Harvest Moon Story of Seasons and she and I love these kind of farming games. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm dying. And uh, we, she told me about it because apparently like the thing is you can like hop into other people's farms and help them with their crops and I, that's not the first time that mechanics I mean, it's called Farm Together so you better be able to. Talk for a minute. Okay, I'm going to talk about how if a game's I, literally what I just said. If games called Farm Together. I would hope that there's some sort of a co-op element to Thank it. You, I just had to take some water because I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. I'm not literally dying. I have a bad cough. Anyway, <clears throat> so the thing about this game is that you just go through and you plant crops and you grow crops, but the crops are timed to like real time. And so like if you plant like a lettuce, a head of lettuce, it takes maybe 10 minutes real time to grow. Yes. And that's like real life. It's just like real life, but that's like not like story of season. Anyway, so and you water it and the crops grow faster. And then what happens is the seasons only last 18 minutes, which is like. That's so fast. It's so fast. And I like how the story of seasons harvest moon, you have the 30 day cycles and you have the festivals and the villagers. But I have to make this you quick. I feel like you have time. I have to make this quick because my voice is going. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So I tried playing. Do you like this game or not? <laughs> it's not for me. Okay. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> it's not for me because there's no 
it's all literally just farming. There's no other sim to it. There's no land to explore, characters to interact with, relationships to build, people to marry, festivals to go to. You know, so the title is extremely literal. Literal, yes. But and it is farm together, and that is all you do. Well, you farm, yeah. And then every time you, you grow something, you get experience points. And then when you get experience points, you level up. And then you can add buildings to your farm. You can get animals. So it's not like it's just you literally plant crops all day. You can get buildings and animals and well, no, but other it's all stuff. farming related. Right. Yeah, so I mean, this is something new I learned about myself. Is it's not just the farming stuff I like; it's the other. You like to get it in in video games, and that's okay. Girl, I love you. You get me. I anyway, know I do because you're me. I, you see, we're the same human. Well, ladies, Steinbacher. And, ladies and gentlemen, before my vo voice completely shits the bed, becomes worm fodder, goes six feet under. I think we will wrap up this show. Steinbacher, do we have anything going on coming up that we should talk about? Uh, Patreon streams. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me pull that up on our um I believe it is later later in the month of February. Yeah, so the plan is we're gonna have our after hours and our happy hour QA stream on Saturday, February twenty third. And those are Patreon exclusive streams. For more information, you can go to patreon.com slash what's good games. Basically, we drink and take your questions in a crazy Q and A, which is always really fun. And then after hours, maybe we'll be playing Anthem. Because Anthem will be Oh out. yeah, maybe. I think that's the plan. And Hell then, yeah. I think we can say this for sure, to March okay. 16th, mark thine hmm. calendars, because we are going to be doing a stream regarding the future of our Patreon and some tiers we're going to be changing and what we have planned for you. And that'll be really exciting. We haven't actually, this is the first time we've talked about it. I think it announced the date. So if we go back on that date, don't be mad. This is my announcement with a little asterisk. This is a tentative so, date. A tentative date. But yes. other than that, I think we're good. Andrea will be yeah. out again next week because she's going to be at Dice kicking some ass. So it'll be another Britain Steimer show. Oh, I Unle love our Britain Unless Steimer Unless we want to invite some unsuspecting We can probably school. find someone else too. But if not, then we're, we're pretty okay. We're pretty okay. Well, thank yeah. you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to this episode of What's Good Games. And we will be back next week. Bye. Bye.